We're going to begin now. I'm just going to pray for us. Okay. God, we thank you that we can be here this morning, Jesus. We thank you for the absolute honor and privilege that it is to be able to stand here in community, God, because of you. Jesus, your name is powerful, God. We just, yeah, we give you praise this morning, God, and we, we just know that Jesus' name is above every worry, every fear, every pain, every struggle, and we declare your name this morning, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. 
Sometimes even, I always say this, but if we don't understand it, if we don't feel it, God, you're more powerful than anything that's even gone through the minds of any of us in this room, any burden, any struggle. <coughs> Jesus, your name is more powerful over that. And yeah, we just declare the name of Jesus over every fear in this room, every struggle that this week has brought, everything that's coming in the weeks, months ahead. Yeah, we declare the name of Jesus and we praise you, God. Amen. sound of his voice in the seas that are shaken and stirred they can be calmed and broken for my regard and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and through it all through it all it is well through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe. Even when my eyes can't see But this mountain that's in front of me It will be thrown into the midst of the sea Cause through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all my soul, it 
truth of those lyrics God when we sing the mountain that's in front of us God you you take our burdens God you want us to surrender our burdens to you you are right there with us even if we can't feel it or as Justin will speak about this morning sometimes we can't perceive you God but we can absolutely learn to we can trust once we learn more things about you God I just pray this morning that we we learn more about who you are that we can we can leave some of I don't know, the unfamiliar outside the door. Um, and just, yeah, God, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for all of these people. I pray a blessing over each and every person in this room. Yeah, Jesus, we love you. Amen. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Mac, like the Big Mac. I just want to say good morning. Um, I just want to share um, what God has put in my heart. Um, when I was spending time with God yesterday, just me and him, I felt like he highlighted the word forgiveness to me. And I just want to use this short time that I have just to encourage you guys about forgiveness. And the Lord uh, led me to this verse in Mark, and I'll just read it to you guys. It says, whenever you stand praying... If you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will forgive you of your wrongdoings. But if you don't forgive, either will your Father in heaven forgive you of your wrongdoings. And as I read that verse, um, it, it sounds like it's easy the way he says it, but it's hard. Because when people do wrong things to us, we tend to go to speak evil to them or say bad things to them behind their backs. But God gives us this opportunity, an open space to obey him, to forgive them. And it says at the end of this verse, as we forgive them, the Father in heaven forgives us 
of our wrongdoings. And, um, and Jesus says that he encouraged his people. He said, but you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And I just want to encourage you with that, that Jesus wants us to love people, even though it's really hard sometimes. But I know there's a reason why he commands us to do this. And I just want to use this time to encourage you guys that God wants us to forgive those who hurt us. And um, yeah, as we take communion, I just want to remind you guys that Jesus himself forgave us from our sins. And he died on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again and defeated death. And uh, yeah, I just want to say I love you guys. And thanks for listening. And um, I just want to pray real quick. Um, all of you. Yeah, Father, I just come before your presence right now. Jesus, you're so close to us. Um, You're not a far God. You're actually a a God that is close and near. Father, I just bless my brothers and sisters this this morning. I just ask Holy Spirit that you'll just pour your spirit upon them, that they may sense your presence today, God, like never before, that you're the God that loves and forgives. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, Big Mac, I love it. 
You're not that big, Mac. Uh, but welcome, my name is Justin, uh, glad to have so many of you here, I uh, see a few new faces, it's good, great to have you guys, uh, very welcome. Uh, as a church, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, so it's the uh, second book in the New Testament, Matthew, then Mark, and we've been kind of going through it since the, the, the beginning, and so if you want, you can go back and check out those messages on, on Facebook and see them if you missed anything, but we're going to be picking up today where we left off yesterday in Mark chapter 7. And uh, the topic that we're going to be looking at as we look at this passage in Mark has to do with this word. And the word is perception. Now, I realize you're a smart group of people, and you all know what the word perception means. But I also know that when you don't know what a word means, you're like, oh, yeah, I know, I know. And then you Google it, right? <laughs> and you're like, then, yeah. So I did that for you, just in case, right? So here we go, Perception. Perception is the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through the senses. Or it's the way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. And today we're going to specifically look at this word in reference to God. The ability to see, hear, or become aware of God through the senses. And the way in which something is regarded, understood. The way in which God is regarded, understood, or interpreted. Because the truth of the matter is, is that, I mean, we look around the world, uh, most people go through lives uh, as if God's not even there, right? They're just totally unaware uh, of his existence, of the fact that he's there. They, they don't recognize him. They, they don't see things that are happening and, and interpret uh, him at work um, in this world or in this lives. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that when it comes to God, we have a bit of a perception problem. It's, it's hard for us to understand and be able to perceive who God is, and you could Google it, but you're going to come up with all kinds of crazy answers, right? And, and, and we got these things that, that block us and, and get in the way of us being able to see and understand who God is. And, and today we're going to look at these two questions, and, and we're going to try and answer these questions. It's what blocks you from being able to see, hear, or become aware of Jesus, and what is it that keeps you from being able to understand or interpret or relate to God? Now, there's some of you here, and maybe you're even here for the first time, and you're like, sweet. Like this, I'm, you're on the edge of your seat, you're like perking up a little bit because this is what you want. Like you came because you're like, I, I came because I wanted to be able to see and perceive and to understand a little bit more of what God is doing. And then there's others of you that your heart is in the same place, but you're like totally playing it cool. You're like, I got this. Because you've been going to church since you were little, right? And so you know how to play the part. You, you're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I know God. I mean, I believe in God. But yet oftentimes we go through our weeks almost totally unaware, <laughs> totally not perceiving, not hearing his voice on a regular basis. And sometimes religious people, and we talked about this last week, and this is exactly what we're picking up from, their lips are saying, oh, yeah, I understand God. I know what God's all about. But their hearts are hungry because there's something that's blocking them, that they actually aren't able to perceive and see and listen and hear God with their senses, and, and they don't understand and interpret what God's doing every single day in their lives. And the truth is, is that God is at work today, this very day, right now, just as much as he's been at work in the scriptures, in, in the story that we're going to look at, the passage we're going to look at today, and he wants us to be able to perceive and see. But the truth of the matter is, is there's things that block us. And so I want you to ask that question as we look at this. What blocks you from being able to hear, to see, become aware of Jesus? And what is it that keeps you from understanding or interpreting or relating to God? What is that for you personally? What's that for you in your heart? So as we, as we look in this, would you start, uh, would you just pray with me? Let's just pray and let's just ask God to, to teach us. God, as we look at this passage um, today, I just pray that you would open up our eyes. Help us to see, help us to perceive God, sometimes um, we are just so dull, we're so dense, we don't notice what you're doing. And there's reasons, and, and we don't even know why. And I just pray that you would help us to see that a little bit more clearly today as we look at your word, as we look at Jesus, uh, what you did, and, and how you interacted with, with people and your people. God, I just pray that you just be with my words and be with uh, everyone's ears here as, as we try and listen to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. So this is uh, Mark chapter 7, and we're going to look at 24. 
Now, if you don't have a Bible, um, there's a Bible app on your phone. You can even download it right now real quick. This will be a little bit easier if you look at the Bible with me. You can kind of follow along and, and see what we're talking through. And, and we kind of point to that every week because the point of what we do here is to help you be able to read the Bible for yourself. I mean, if you're relying on us the whole time, that kind of defeats the purpose. We want to equip you to be able to dig in yourself. And there's some Bibles in the back of the room. Grab one. They're just sitting there. I mean, somebody's got to take them. So grab a Bible. We'd love for you to have one. Uh, But this is Mark chapter 7, and this is immediately following the passages last week, where there's this group of people that, um, it says this, these people honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. They've let go of the commands. They're no longer listening to God, and instead they're they're just going through the motions. They're just religious. And Jesus leaves this very religious place, and this is what it says. He left that place, and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. That doesn't mean anything to you. You're thinking about the wheels on your car. No. This place is, this is a bad place. Everyone, like, people reading this back in in the day this was written, everyone knew Tyre is a place where wicked people live, right? It almost like going from here, like where we're a little bit closer to God, all the way over to Dublin. They don't know. They don't know God over there. You guys are getting this? Or or maybe maybe a little bit better. Maybe it's more like uh, Vegas, Sin City. Right? It has a reputation. This place has a reputation for being totally against God. Uh, there's a verse in 1 Kings that says this. This kind of summarizes what this place is known for. Uh, there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he's urged on by his wife, Jezebel. Jezebel. And some of you may have heard that. That word now is almost synonymous in our culture with somebody who's just like an unscrupulous woman, a, a woman that is just wicked and evil, right? Or Jezebel. And Jezebel was from this place, Tyre. And this place was known for being totally against God, and that's where Jesus goes. And this is what it says. It says, he entered a house, and he did not want anyone to know it. Yet, he could not keep his presence secret. I don't know, maybe he just wanted to get away from religious people. He was sick of dealing with them, and he needed a little bit of rest. I can understand that. But there's a truth here that I think is really important when it comes to the topic that we're talking about today. Because there's something about Jesus that even though he kind of wanted to keep to himself, he didn't walk into town announcing, hey, everybody, I'm here. For some reason, people knew that he couldn't keep it a secret. So you can't keep Jesus a secret. You just can't. There's something about Jesus, there's something about who he is that isn't meant to stay hidden. There's something about Jesus that is meant to be revealed and shown. It's in his very nature. You can try and hide it, but it won't work. And I know that there are some of you who are sitting here today because maybe you've experienced a little something of Jesus and you could just tell, man, there's truth in this. There's something about this and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I know it's there and it just draws you. And, and there was something about Jesus that drew this woman who was from this evil place, right? And, and this is what it says. It says, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, A woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. This woman was a Greek, and she was born in Syrian Phoenicia. And she begged Jesus to to drive the demon out of her daughter. So this woman comes to Jesus because she's got a problem. See, the, the, the problem when it comes to perceiving God, see, Jesus, his nature wants to be shown. He wants to be seen, but the problem is something that's inside us. It's not Jesus that's the problem. There's the problem is something inside us. And this verse is, is kind of bringing us to understand one of the problems because th- this woman is, is begging Jesus because she's looking to Jesus to help her with something that she has no control over. She's got a daughter that has a purity problem. There's an impure spirit. And she's looking to Jesus for help. Now, I, I want to... Uh, just show you a little illustration here to help you understand uh, what's going on and what this woman has struggled with. She's got a purity problem. This is a pint glass of water. I stopped by the lock. I didn't rob this. I, I, I asked them for it. Um, and they said, oh, yeah, I'm doing a talk. I need a pint glass. Pint glass, limerick water, straight from the source, that faucet in the back of the room. Crystal clear. <laughs> would, you, would you drink this? If you trust me, some of you are like, I don't trust you, I'm not drinking that. <laughs> right? 
But this is pure. It's crystal clear. And you know because you can see through it. You can see right through it. Okay? But what if I got a bag of dirt here? Just got a little, that's a little boring just for good luck. All right. Would you drink this now? Some of you are in front of you like, it looks like a Guinness now. Some of you are like, <laughs> it's not. But you wouldn't drink this now. Why? It's full of impurity. And you, you can see it. You could see through this before. But you can't see through it now. Because there's something about impurity that keeps you from being able to perceive. It keeps you from being able to see things clearly. It's just the nature of it. It's the way it works. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 8, in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. There's something about purity that helps you see, but impurity, on the other hand, it blocks your view. And let me give you some examples, like greed this is an example of impurity. Greed makes you think, oh, I need that, I need that. And then you're always wanting more, and you're never satisfied. You aren't able to see and perceive that you have all that you need. You, it robs you of the ability to be thankful for what you have, and you're always wanting more because it messes with your perception. Or, or lust, right? Lust. It, it leaves you objectifying someone for your own personal gratification it, it makes you unable to see them with the dignity that they should be seen in, and you see them differently because impurity affects your ability to see things clearly. But it's not just a perception problem, is it? Right? Because I don't drink this or not drink it just because it looks impure. If I drink this, it's going to cause problems, right? Right? If I drink this, there can be brown water come out of places there should not be brown water coming out of, right? It is going to be a mess. It is not going to be good. Because the truth of the matter is, is that impurity hurts people. It's not that God just wants to ruin our fun. Impurity hurts people. When we approach things outside of the way that, that God designed for them to be approached, it messes stuff up. And I think a lot of times when we hear purity, we automatically go to sexual purity. It's, it's so much more than that. But sexual purity is, is something that we can understand because we can see the effects, the pain that impurity causes all around this city. There are so many people that are living in broken families, so many kids that don't have parents to look up to because people approach this with just like, oh, whatever. Oh, it's just about me. And we, we even start to identify uh, as if it's who we are, our preferences sexually. That's, that's so much less than what God designed for us, and it causes problems, and we don't even begin to see the immensity of the problems it solves. But you look around, and there's some of you have grown up, and, and you've experienced this. There's, it causes pain. That's why God doesn't want us to do it. Impurity causes pain. And this woman has a daughter who is caught and impurity. And some of you might know somebody that you love and care about who is just, who, they're trapped in it. Because that's what impurity does, right? It, it grabs a hold of you. It's intoxicating. It tells you, oh, I'll satisfy you. This is what you need. But it always leaves you wanting more. And you're never satisfied. It's what it does. It grabs a hold of you. And this woman has a daughter who's trapped in it, and she is begging Jesus for help. And picture her down on her knees asking Jesus for help. And listen to what Jesus says in response. This is what he says. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and to toss it to the dogs. All right, this is not how I was expecting Jesus to reply. Like I, I've been married for a while now, and I know one thing. Women do not like to be referenced or referred to as dogs. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yes, see. Said. But they don't like that, right? And there's something in what Jesus is saying here that for us, it, 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 like, what, what are you saying, Jesus? And I imagine even for her, she did not get this straight away. She was like, Jesus, what? what? I imagine she had to sit there and think about it a little bit. I want to share a story with you that maybe will help you understand and think through this with this woman who's trying to figure it out too, right? 
Uh, a good few years ago, I had an opportunity with a group of people to go and build a house for a family that didn't have a house in Mexico. They lived in a really poor area. Um, they barely had enough to get by. They barely had enough to get by. And so I went with a team of people there, and we were building this family a house. And they were working alongside us. We were getting to know them as we built it. It was really cool. But um, as we were building, there was this dog that was there, and this dog was a skeleton. This dog was on the brink of death. It was sad. I mean, the dog didn't have anything to eat. It was clear. And there was a woman on the team with us that she saw this dog, and naturally, I mean, she had some compassion, and she went and bought this dog food. But I'll never forget when she gave that dog food, watching the family that we were building the house for in utter disgust. They were looking at this, and how dare, how, why would you give a dog food when my kids haven't eaten? Do you see the injustice here? How dare you feed a dog when there's kids right here that haven't eaten for days? Now, this lady, she didn't perceive, she didn't understand or know what was going on. She didn't mean to offend them. But there's a truth that is being said in here that Jesus is saying, but it just takes us a little time. We have to think about it. And Jesus speaks these words to this woman. Let the children eat. It's not that this is untrue. It's not even that this is unjust. It's wrong. I don't think he's referring to her as a dog. But I think with, with laser accuracy, Jesus is pinpointing a place in her heart that is perhaps blocking her from being able to perceive what God is doing or what God wants to do in her life. Now, she could have responded as often we would, and she could have been offended. How dare you call me a dog? How dare you refer to me? As, but she didn't. Instead, this is what she says. She says, Lord. Lord, she replied. She responded with respect, with reverence. She even responded in which a, 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 such a way as to communicate very clearly she was looking up to Jesus. Here's the thing, and this is what we see in this. One of the things that stops us from being able to perceive God is pride. It's pride. And this lady could have responded in pride, but she doesn't. Now, a lot of times I think when we think of the word pride, we always think, right, of somebody who, like, thinks so highly of themselves and looks down upon others, Right? But it works both ways. See, pride also keeps you from being able to look up. It stops you from being able to look up. Because you can be so prideful that you're never able to look up to someone that knows more, that sees more, that perceives more of you. And, and, and I think that, the, that, that this kind of pride is actually so much more rampant in our world. It hides itself under the guise of just equality. Oh yeah, I'm just all about equality. But what it does is it traps people. It makes them unable to ever look up to anyone and especially to be able to look up to God, to know more, to understand more. And it, it traps you, it traps you right in those perceptions. And a good sign that, that maybe that's something you struggle with is actually getting offended. <laughs> And this lady could have had that in her heart, and sometimes we have it in her heart, and sometimes even the things that Jesus say offend us. But this woman, she didn't respond in pride. And this is in direct contrast to the religious people. They didn't refer to Jesus as Lord, but this woman who was wicked, who had a reputation for being anti-God, she is able to see what they can't see. And she responds to him with humility. This is what she says. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, because you were able to perceive this, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home, and she found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. That impurity that had such a hold on her daughter's life just wiped away. She received, she inherited, she received a gift from God that was so incredible a gift that is intended, and you can even see this in, this, in Jesus' words, for his children. See, here, here's the, Jesus says it this way. He, he says, uh, blessed, let's go put it up there, blessed are the humble, blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. I think sometimes we think of you know, what are, who inherits more from God? Well, that's whoever works the hardest, you know. Whoever does the most good things in their life, they're the ones that inherit more from God. Nope. 
That's the way our religious people a lot of times replace it. No, it's not that. Or, or we think, well, wicked people, they would never, I mean, this lady, she's wicked. No, it's the humble. It's the humble. It's the people that are able to recognize where they are and where God is and to direct their attention towards him, to be able to perceive him. That's what God wants, and that's what Jesus wanted for this woman. And with laser focus, he was able to say words that would probably get right to the core of whatever it was. And he does this over and over in Scripture, whatever it was that was going to stop her from being able to perceive who he was. See, humility doesn't just require that you don't overvalue yourself. Humility also requires that you don't undervalue yourself. And there's a good chance this woman Maybe she was prone to think, oh, you know what? There's nothing I could ever receive from God. And maybe some of you are here today, and you can't imagine that the God of the universe would ever have a gift or something that he would want to give you because you just don't think you're good enough. And I think Jesus' words maybe caused her to grapple with that. In fact, Jesus uses the words in here. It wasn't just like a stray dog. It was like a little dog. It was like a family dog. I think Jesus was trying to help her see, no, I want, you, you can receive what I want to give, but you have to view it with humility, which means not only that you don't overvalue, but also that you don't undervalue yourself. It's both of those things because pride keeps us from perceiving God. And there's so much at stake. God wants to be seen. Jesus wants to be seen. It, it is in his very nature. And in Mark, we see it over and over and over and over again. In fact, in, in the very next story, and you can go back and read this. I'm just going to tell you a little bit what happens. There's this guy that's deaf and mute, and uh, Jesus heals him. And, and it's almost like a direct reference to what was spoken about Jesus in the same prophet that Jesus quoted to give out to the religious people. The same prophet said this, Isaiah. He said, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. This is spoken 700 years before Jesus is here. And he, 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 he talks to this guy who is both deaf and mute, ears open. All of a sudden, he can talk. It's a miracle. And God's doing this stuff left, right, and center. There's so many things that are pointing to the fact that Jesus wants to be seen. He wants people to know who he is. He wants people to be able to look up and see. But for some reason, they just can't. At the beginning of, of chapter 8, yet again, Jesus feeds the multitudes. 4,000 people are fed with seven loaves and two fish. Seven plus two does not equal 4,000. But, uh, but, but there are seven baskets left over. God has plenty enough to feed. But the problem is we don't perceive it. And, and the religious people that were yet again there, they didn't perceive what Jesus was doing. They didn't understand who he was because there was something blocking them. Maybe it was pride. Maybe it was their own impurity. I don't know what it was, but they couldn't see. And even the disciples were struggling to understand. Listen to Jesus' words as he talks to his disciples. He says this, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but you fail to see, and ears, but fail to hear. Don't you remember? He's doing this over and over and over. This isn't the first time he's done this. God is at work doing the same things today that he was doing back then. The problem isn't him. The problem is we can't see it. And he's, he's, he's imploring. He's calling out to us. He wants us to see. But what is it that's blocking you? This is where you got to make this personal. you got to look into your own heart. Where is it that's blocking you from being able to see, hear, become aware? What keeps you from understanding, interpreting, or relating to God? Is, it, is there an impurity? Is it, is it pride? Do you even know what it is? I, I want to finish with this last story, also in Mark, and you can follow along in your Bibles. But I think this story directly provides how you can apply what I'm saying today in your own life to overcome impurity, to overcome pride that keeps us from seeing. So this is Jesus with his disciples, and they come to a place called, place called Bethsaida. And some people there brought a blind man, and they begged Jesus to touch him. And Jesus then takes this blind man by the hand, and he led him outside the village. 
So, I mean, picture this. And this is a theme we've already seen a few times. There's a lot of people that are never going to get close to Jesus unless a friend brings them to see Jesus. There's some of you that are here right now, and you're hearing about Jesus because somebody brought you. Because that's just the way it works. Because God works that way, and he's still working that way today. And these guys have a friend that they bring him over, and now they hand him off, and Jesus just takes him by the hand. He's never I've never met Jesus before, right? This is, imagine a stranger takes you by the hand and you're blind and is leading you through the city and outside of it. It would have been pretty freaky, <laughs> right? You ever seen the, those trust falls demonstrated? We're not going to do it right now because we don't have time, right? Close your eyes, fall back. Do you trust me? I'll catch you. And it takes loads of trust to actually catch somebody, right? And, and there's a, an element of, of, of you're seeing with this man. He has to trust Jesus to lead him. <laughs> is Jesus going to lead him? But again, it's, I think sometimes when we think about faith, we just relate it to that trust fall. Like, oh, you just got to fall back and Jesus will catch you. And, and he does. That's the starting place for faith. But it does not stop there. Jesus leads him, right? Gentle nudge this way. And he has to walk that way. Gentle nudge this way. He has to walk this way. And if he doesn't, he's going to run into the wall. That's not Jesus' fault. Jesus is trying to show him the way. And sometimes we're running into walls and we're like, Jesus, how can you let this happen? And he's like, I'm trying like, he's, he wants to guide us, but sometimes our pride is keeping us from trusting. So this is a direct way to, under, to overcome your pride. Before you see, you have to trust Jesus to lead you where you cannot see. Before you see, you have to trust Jesus to lead you where you cannot see. It's a spiritual principle. You see it all throughout the Bible. It's just the way it is. That's where it starts, but it doesn't finish there, all right? Because God wants to open his eyes. He wants them to see. But faith starts there. God's, Jesus is guiding him through the city. He's trusting Jesus. They get outside, right? And this is what happens. He spit on the man's eyes, and he put his hands on him. And Jesus asks, do you see anything? And I don't know why Jesus spit. I think sometimes people read stuff like this, and they're like over-spiritualizing it. Like, Jesus got the holy spit, you know? <laughs> just rub it on there. But I actually think that a lot of times the way Jesus is working is just practical. I think this guy had so much gunk in his eyes that he's not used to, and, and he needed Jesus to provide a little lubricant to wipe the gunk away, because <laughs> there's too many impurities. And sometimes we got so much gunk in our life, and, and we need to lean into Jesus, because he wants to wipe it away. He wants to do it, but half the time, you know what we're doing? He's wiping it away, and then we go, put the gunk back in us, <laughs> like... Because he wants us to, but, and we need his help, and, and only he can help us to do it, but there's a role that we have to play. And sometimes following Jesus is just practical. There's stuff in your life that you got to stop because you know, you know you're putting into your life over and over, but you know it's no good for you. You know it's not helping you, but you can't stop because that's what impurities do. They tell you, you need more, you need more, but they leave you unsatisfied. But you got to be honest with yourself. Where do impurities have a hold of your life? Jesus wants to wipe it away. And he does, and he wipes it away, and this man looks up, and they said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. He sees, but he doesn't yet perceive. Right? There's a difference. He sees, but he still needs Jesus' help to understand what he sees. I think this is a lot of where the disciples were probably at, were at right now. They, they were seeing, but they still didn't quite understand, and Jesus was trying to help them understand. And there's a principle here because Jesus wanted them to see clearly. He didn't want them to just be guided around through the dark. He wants us to be able to perceive what he's doing here and now in the present because he's still doing it. He's still doing it right now. He's at work. Some of you guys are noticing little things right now. And if you start to just follow him and trust him as he guides you, you're going to see more. Because it's the way Jesus is. It's what he does. He wants to be seen clearly. He's at work. I love this. This is in all the Gospels. John 1140. It says this. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Pray with me. God. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the clarity. <laughs> Sometimes we read through this stuff and we're dense. Um, God, I, it took me a while to figure some of this stuff out as I was preparing this week. God, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you um, for forgiving us. Thank you for helping us to see. And sometimes we're just so stubborn. God, I pray for um, everybody in this room right now. If there is impurities in their life that they have struggled maybe for years to get rid of, help them. God, 
help them lean into even a friend that's here. God, to give them the power and the strength to get rid of those things that are destroying them. God, for people that, that they've held on to pride, um, they've leaned too heavy into what they know and understand, God, give them the courage to take those steps of faith. And I know it's scary. It's scary for me even now sometimes, God. And I just pray that you'd help them. Because you want to be seen. And I, God, I want to see more and more people here in this city who are following you and who are walking with their eyes open, perceiving and becoming aware of what you're doing on a daily basis, not just on a Sunday, not just tradition. God, open our eyes. Help us to see. We love you, Jesus. Amen. If you just stand with us for the last time, please. Thanks. Touching every heart, and I worship you, and I worship you. You are hearing, oh, you're healing every heart, and I worship you, oh, I worship you. And you are hearing. You're turning lives around, and I worship you, God, I worship you. And you are hearing, you're mending every heart, and I worship you, I worship you, and you are waiting. Keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are. you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. And you are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. And that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Jesus, we trust that if we feel something, it's not always true. Feelings are valid and relevant, but your truth is ten times more powerful, God. You are so much more powerful than the lies that go through our minds about who you are and many other things. So I just declare the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus over everybody in this room. I pray for a renewal of every mind in this room, even if we've been at this one day or ten years getting to know you, Jesus. I pray for a renewal and transformation of our minds and our hearts, God, that today can be the beginning for absolutely anyone. And yeah, Jesus, I just uh, invite anybody in the room to even just whatever they're going through, to surrender it to you, Jesus. To just to take one small step of trust, God, and know that you are there, absolutely there with them. And it just takes the tiniest bit of faith. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. I, I just wanted to close. I did this last service too because I just think it's cool because it's just the way you see God working. So uh, this morning we had a set picked out of songs to sing, and that last one wasn't in it at all. Like, and uh, so one of the the girls who was supposed to sing was sick, and so the song that we were gonna sing, Boyd's like, I can't sing that. So he just picked a song that he could play on guitar. <laughs> he had no idea, but the song ended up being perfect. Because there's times when you just see God working, and it's totally outside of our control. It's just one little example, but the song fits so well with, with what I was talking about today, and uh, that wasn't our plan. <laughs> and so it's just a cool way. I hope it got, encourages you guys to just be trusting Him, to, to really see Him at work more in your lives. Um, next week, uh, we are going to have a, uh, a barbecue here, um, and so we'd love for you. I think it's Father's Day. We'll celebrate Father's, but we'll celebrate eating, too. Um, so we'll have some barbecues. If you want to bring some meat, uh, that'd be great. Uh, we'll, if, even if you want to bring like side dishes, whatever you guys want to bring, we'll all eat together. A braai, if you will, my South African friends. <laughs> <That's something. laughs> uh, also, I mentioned this last week. I had, we had some people, and I have a small group that meets every week, and we had a few there that uh, are speaking Portuguese, and I know there's some of you here today. I just want to let you guys know, I appreciate you guys. I know that it is hard to be in a place where you don't 
know the language and trying to like sort through it. When I first got here, I didn't feel like I could understand anybody either. <laughs> and I spoke English. Um, so I feel you guys. But uh, if there's any of you guys that want to be a part of a, a group where they do speak Portuguese, and if we can help facilitate that, I want to help make that happen. So just let me know. But uh, thank you guys for being here. Get to know somebody on your way out. Grab some tea and coffee, and we will see you next week.